Okay, just a very, very quick one about the George, uh, SGS George Call Services, because probably most of you know SGS as a testing and certification company. This is what it is. But we have a division inside the mineral uh, business to, for George Call Services that it's operating for more than 30 years. Uh, that's actually responsible for targeting exercise, resource estimate, uh, mining program, uh, environment, and everything. So uh, we, are, we are operating everywhere. We complete more than 1,000 projects over 30 countries. Before going into the deep of the subject, I really want to do a very brief uh, history about AI because each time I speak about AI, everybody says, okay, it's something very new, very new. It is not that new because it's around since the computer science started about, uh, about uh, 80 years ago. And we, as we can see, even in the 40s with the first computers, the idea of creating a machine that can think was already in the center mind of uh, the, the first generation software engineers. Uh, it's really start with that man. So the picture you see over there, that's Mr. Alan Turing. So he's become a famous uh, British mathematician that actually cracked the Enigma code uh, of the German army during the World War II. He's also the one who put the foundation of the cognitive testing uh, by the Turing test and the artificial intelligence. And in the 50s, they start also the first software that uh, by Mr. Arthur Samuel. It was a checker program for one simple reason. Check is a very simple game, so it was easy to program at that time and easy for the... 50s age computer to, uh, to be able to process. And actually it was a very good one because he the, when he started this game in 1956, he can, the, the program was beaten by five-year-old children. And after two years, actually even the best player in the industry wasn't able to beat the program. So, and in the 50s, the big, the big mark, the Darwin Conference. So it's all the software specialists at that time hardware, software, just gather for three months uh, in Dartmouth. And this is after that conference that they start to use the term AI and that would stick with the rest, with the rest of the story. Not much in the 60s and the 70s for one obvious reason. The computing power, computing power wasn't there. People had very, very good ideas, but they just cannot realize those ideas. So we need to wait with the personal computer to, uh, to start in the late 70s, early 80s, and uh, with all the progress of the computer uh, hardware in the 90s, we see here the, uh, the oops, sorry, the deep blue computer, I go a little bit too fast, but a deep blue computer that beat Gary Kasparov in chess in 1997. And now today, so we have almost unlimited computing power, so we can see here the IBM Watson system that won GeoParty in 2011, and now we can do some very, very heavy computing with the deep learning and the, and the neural network. Now, applying it to mineral exploration, this is what is something new, uh, and it's new, and I, I like to use that graph because that graph actually is the one that triggers everything. In the exploration business for the past century, it was a very simple rule of thumb. If you spend more money, you discover more deposit and you discover more ounces or tons of your minerals. That was true until around 2010, when you see we have an ex a very sharp increase in the uh, exploration expenditure and a very sharp decrease in the discovery. There's multiple reasons that can explain that, but one of the easiest one is because the easy deposit are already being discovered. So everything that we discover now is deep undercover, it's, uh, it's deep, it's undercover, and it's on remote regions. So when the when exploration companies saw this, they said, okay, we probably need to get new tools because our ordinary tools that we use for the past decades just are not efficient enough to discover those new deposits. So this is why they decide to put a little bit more emphasis on how we can use AI and machine learning to help the discovery, the future discovery. Because for a lot of big companies, even junior companies, they, uh, they work on camp that it's known and mined for, for decades or century, and they have an enormous amount of data, but most of this data is just not used because uh, because it's on, on difficult format, or it was never integrated fully inside their geological model, or it was actually, they, don't, they just don't know what to do with it because they don't see any, uh, any very good uh, link or trend between some type of data sets and the result that they've got from drilling. So with those hundreds and hundreds of uh, thousands of meters of core and all those analysis, satellite imagery, everything, so this is where we have actually all the power of AI because to be very efficient using this type of data sets in artificial, in artificial intelligence, we need to have enormous amount of data so the computer can actually try to do, the, to do deep link between the data sets. So it's transforming this data into new knowledge that we can use and we can use to create targets and to create the future generation of discovery. 
In a very simple term, I like this slide because it's quite simple. So we have a huge data sets, we apply machine learning, and we generate new knowledge. And by applying machine learning, it's very simple. It's just statistical algorithm that when we apply to a large set that will help us to correlate trends and that will otherwise be, that will be missed by the normal geologist. That because the computer thing outside the box is not biased by any of our learning, so he doesn't try to find something that is real for him, and he's gonna learn from that, from the real things, and try to generate something new. So that will add an enormous amount of value to our data sets because he's gonna use everything. Uh, we're doing a lot of different work in SGS, so we use a lot of different algorithms, but I just want to focus a little bit on the three uh, main ones that we use. It's not an exhaustive list, so there's a lot of other, uh, other type of algorithms out there that are used by other companies, but those ones are well known and actually work pretty well. Uh, we, what we use actually uh, internally, so we have a software called Genesis, so it's our own proprietary software that was developed over the, few, over the next few decades, but also use, I'm also a big user of Microsoft Azure platform, Orange is another one that we discussed this morning. Uh, Azure it's and Orange are quite similar, the way that they work, the only difference Azure of course is Microsoft, so it's not free, but it's fairly cheap, so it's not a big, it's not a big amount of money you need to spend. One of the first one I want to talk about, it's, uh, it's probably the, the one that is not very well known because it's, it's fairly new. It's called the phylogenetics type of algorithm. And it was something that is used by biology for, for a lot of time. And when we decide to, uh, to actually create something new, we, dis we just look at that and say, okay, so the biologists, they use those type of algorithm to create actually trend into DNA sequencing try to try to uh, to, uh, to discover the evolutionary trend and, and of different living species. But at the end, a rock also evolved through time. It's just using different process. So getting that in mind, say, can we apply on geochemical data sets this type of algorithm and see if you can discover a new trend and how it's going to work? Uh, we test that in the oil industry about two years ago, more or less. And uh, this is a little bit more uh, like the workflow looked like. So we have we need to have a very good quality data sets with a lot of entries, so multi-element analysis from QuemScanics, RFICP, doesn't matter at, at, as, as long as you have geochem data sets and it's a great quantity and well organized. With this, whoops, with this phylogenetics, we can go back, eh, can we? Okay, the red one, okay. So we've got here, we create actually an evolutionary tree of the rock. So you see we have a start point, of course, that could be the middle here, and we have those branches, and those branches, if they are close together, it seems that, it seems that the rock is actually in the same group, and, uh, and, and when they go far away from the origin, it's because they are very different from the origin, so they evolve through different process more than another group of rocks. So with that, we do rock grouping, and we model everything, and we try to predict how the rock will actually uh, be, uh, the, uh, be in space. And that can save uh, a great amount of drill time and, and drill, uh, drill money and drill time because if you have a very good control in your environment, mostly in the oil and gas because we have uh, relatively uh, simpler geology, so it's something that's really useful. Another one that we use is probably one of the best known type of algorithm uh, out there. So it's uh, the, the decision tree, boosted decision tree in this case. Uh, this is a very uh, good uh, type of algorithm because it's great classifier and combine, combine everything, all your data sets into a simple classifier. And after that, you're gonna test all the classifier against each other to give you the more robust possible option. Uh, it's adaptive and it's actually lower the prediction error to the lowest possible. So this is why it's very used. It's used in, uh, in genetics and biology and uh, in tons of other different uh, type of, of application. And this is very, very good for nonlinear correlation. So this is exactly what we have in geology. Uh, if you look at the workflow, this is a little bit what this looks like. So the way that we work, and it's not the only way to work, but it's a very, uh, a very keen one to do. So it's, it's working by block model, like for resource calculation. So we create block model, and we define vectors. The vectors that is actually related to the data sets that we've got and related to the type of deposit that we're working on. And we actually statistically uh, treat those, uh, those vectors, and we put them inside the block model. And out of all, all of those information, we're gonna extract a learning set. 
that it can be variable inside, but what is very important in the learning set, so you need to have true positive and true negative. So the algorithm can learn on something that it's real, that it, we know that it's real. As an example, if we have drill holes, we hit gold, we have a gold assay, so we know that's a true positive, and we have another drill hole five meters away that didn't hit any gold, so that's a true negative, because we know that there's no gold over there. When we have this learning set, so we train him, and when he trained, we take all the data back into a predictor data sets, and we try to predict uh, using those two sets, and we get the predicted uh, sets of data at the end. So that's a simplest way of seeing things, but it's, uh, it's the way it works for most of the, uh, of the machine learning project regarding to targeting. Another one, it's uh, probably uh, not super well known, this one, because it's one of the first one that we use uh, internally. So it's, uh, it's a Bayesian Gaussian algorithm, so it's a Latin process. It's, very, uh, it, it's, a, it's a statistical way to treat the data sets. Uh, this one is very, very used by uh, the law enforcement uh, officer uh, around the world as a facial recognition system. So most of the facial recognition use this one. And the, the, what you have as an advantage is it's a very good to handling missing data. So since in geology we work with very clustered data, so it's very, very good for us to have something that it cap it's capable of handling the missing point and to create probability maps out of this. This is the first one that we use actually uh, when we start to, uh, to use machine learning in uh, mineral exploration about three years ago. A little bit, uh, a small word about validation because it's quite, it's an important one, validation, and it's not an easy thing to do since it's something that it's fairly new in the mining industry. And uh, our type of data, it's not the classical way of uh, machine learning algorithm is used to work, mostly because we work in 3D and most of the other science don't work in 3D. Uh, so they must be used with caution, and we need to do a lot of tests to be sure you validate everything. So that's, uh, the, when you mismatch, that's a very good a classical example of the mismatch distribution between the learning set and your input set. So with this type of, of, of results, so we know that actually that we, we not created good, uh, good and reliable results. So uh, a way that we use, there's many ways, there's a lot of statistical tests that we can do. Uh, we can do use the correlation matrix, that it's a very good tool. But what I really like to do also, it's always compare with the classical weight of evidence. So we extract all the vectors that we put inside the model and we weight them and generate target out of those weight. And we create an enormous amount of iteration with, the different, with different weighting and we look how it corresponds with the machine learning results. Uh, in, our, in, this, in this case, particularly, we do unsupervised machine learning. We talked a little bit this morning, Adrian, about the supervised and unsupervised. I prefer to use unsupervised because the, the, the key things for that type of research is to generate new ideas. So if I actually supervise the learning, I'm going to actually not generate something that new because I'm going to use the knowledge that we already have on every deposits. If we unsupervise it, it's a little bit more tricky because sometimes it can, it can uh, actually create correlation that doesn't really exist, but there's a way that we can see it when we reverse engineer the, uh, the algorithm. But if he, if he find new correlation, I know that it will be something that it's actually outside of the box. Few, uh, few example of project that we did over the past. Uh, everything start with the Integra Gold Rush Challenge. So for those who are familiar with that, so about three, four years ago, so Integra bought a mine in, uh, in a BTB belt, so the Sigma Lamac mine. And they, with the six terabyte of data, they just release everything and, uh, to, uh, to, to, to the public and say build the best possible targeting and uh, we know we've got half a million dollars. And uh, we won actually that contest. Uh, so this is what's, so after that, because we did a lot of research to won that contest and we say, okay, so it seemed that it worked and it create a real value to mining industry to actually try to generate new generation of targets using artificial intelligence. So we, so we start that we started and continue to grow on that direction. And to give you an example of what this looked like, so that was the targeting that we did for the gold rush. And you can see target number seven. So to test the validity of all the targeting, so what Integra did, so they did a discovery before the challenge and they just keep it secret. It was the triangle zone and they want to see who's going to pick up that zone and we pick up that zone. So, and, and other, but not, we're not the only one, but we are the only one using machine learning and to pick up that zone. Another example, so this one I can actually uh, talk about this one, is a West African gold project uh, that we did a few years ago. 
uh, and we create the prospectivity map of the uh, uh, prospectivity map of the uh, the for target for precise targeting. So it was is mostly a gold deposit, but there's also copper zinc and lead and uh, copper zinc and the silver in the region. And we use different type also. Uh, we use machine learning and different type of conditional simulation. Try to be a little bit more precise since we didn't get an enormous amount of data in this one. And this is exactly what it looked like when we, look, when we zoom in. So we've got the main deposits that was already discovered. And this is one of the prospectivity map that we uh, create. So we highlight those zones as very prospective zones for the client. Uh, they, in fact, drill those zones after that, and they discover more ounces of gold. Uh, this one is extremely, it's an origin gold deposit. So there's, a, there's of course, a huge, uh, a huge print by the, by the structure. So this is why we're looking at zone that is along the structure. But that, would, that significantly helped the company to be more efficient in the drilling and discover more ounces of gold. There's limitation, and of course limitation will, will, will actually be uh, more or less important as we grow inside the technique and we grow inside the quality of the, uh, of the job. Uh, when, when more people will do the same job. One of the biggest one we've got right now, and this is exactly where the science stops, it's geology, everything is all about domain. So domaining is extremely, more, is, is extremely important. And right now, with the algorithm we've got, it's not possible to learn from a specific domain and apply the learning of the algorithm to another domain. It's extremely tricky. There's a lot of research and development on that specific field because we are not, it's not only geology that got problem with that, there's other science also. And this is actually where probably most of the money is at the moment in the research and development and machine learning role worldwide. Uh, also, the statistical distribution, all the tests, so like I discussed earlier, so our data set is extremely clustered, and that's a big problem because we need to declusterize everything to try to have a better prediction effect, and that's the, the, and the level of clustering limit the amount of distance that we can look for. Uh, so that's another problem we've got. It's not everything that can be threshold. I, I, I will say, tell you that almost everything can be threshold these days, but there's still some type, specific type of data that's not possible to threshold correctly to be able to use machine learning application. Um, and the vectors, that's probably the, um, the trickiest part of the operation since it's the specialists and the geologists that create the vectors that will help the algorithm to learn. But those vectors are created by geologists and by humans. So it's really depending on what we know of the deposits. So we can use probably not all the vectors, all the possible vectors, or probably not the best vectors in some case. So as a future development, so I'd say it's moving extremely fast. Uh, even it's, it's really difficult for us to, to, keep, to keep up with all the other development that was done in the other science and most in the computing science. But there's an enormous possibilities. And in my personal opinion, in 10 years from now, probably most of the targeting exercise in the world will use some form of machine learning. It's not, it's not a magical tool, so it's not going to give you uh, the goal that their discovery at first drill all, but it's a tool that we add to the other tool that we already have that actually help us to be more efficient in the future for the targeting. Uh, there's also, I talk about application in, in targeting industry, in the exploration industries, but there's a lot of also implication in the processing industry, reconciliation between block model and between the, the mill, and there's a lot, a lot of lot to do, but it's still a very early, uh, a very, very early in the exploration science in the mining industry. So we still have a lot of job to do, but it's, it's fantastic how fast it grows and how, and how, how actually interesting can be the results. <laughs>